hitting that area. And I also saw some tsunamis in the future that were going to come in. And I gave the exact date and time of the big San Francisco earthquake. United States Geological Survey records tell us that at 5 in the afternoon on October 17, 1989, the San Andreas Fault System had its first major quake since 1906. 62 people died. Almost 4,000 were injured. The epicenter was located near Loma Prieta Peak in the Santa Cruz Mountains, approximately nine miles northeast of James Gilliland's home in Santa Cruz. It caused over six billion dollars in damage. Over 18,000 homes and 2,600 businesses were damaged, and about 3,000 people were left homeless. And the only thing I missed was, I was told it would be 6.9, and at the end it was 7.1, but the first readings were 6.9. The prayer of St. Francis, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can. The nooks and rockeries of James' sanctuary contain reminders that a similar message has been delivered to different cultures throughout the ages. And having come back from the dead, James now embraces and expresses a very broad understanding of humanity and spirituality. After the Tibetan Foundation, I went into about six years of intense yoga training with different yogis, and, uh, and I also went through an initiation with the Tibetan master as well. And what's interesting, each one of these masters recognized something very different about me and got very excited when we met, and they knew that I had a very big mission here on Earth, and, and all of them validated the work that I'm doing. One of the most extraordinary experiences James has had when it comes to teachers was when he heard of Ramtha, the teacher of ancient wisdom channeled by Jay-Z Knight at the Ramtha School of Enlightenment in Yelm, Washington, not far from James' sanctuary at Trout Lake. My experience at the Ramtha School was before it was a school. It wasn't even a school yet. It was in the very beginning. And I sat up on a mound meditating, and I heard a lot of negativity about the school and uh, and I never listened to that because usually when there's a lot of gossip there's usually a pretty good teacher <laughs> doing doing their work because they're rattling everybody's cages so uh, uh, I always tell people if you're ready to heal your stuff go see Rampa if you want it sugar-coated and you want to take your time go see somebody else <laughs> you know? but uh, my experience with Rampa was uh, I sat on the mound meditating and I connected in with Roth and I felt the wind come up and the breeze and, and I asked three questions and I said if you really are coming through Jay-Z and this is for real I'd like you to answer these questions because you know you're omniscient I'm sure you know I'm talking to you just speaking your name and focusing on you makes the connection and when I got to the school I was kind of embarrassed because there's about 500 people there and I said, oh, my God, that was pretty arrogant of me, you know, to expect Rafa to come out on stage and answer my three questions with all these people here. But he did. <laughs> he walked right up on stage and pointed right at me and answered my three questions. Now, as I said to you, I was a Catholic priest for all those years. I was a professor of theology for 16 years. I was a lecturer in theology prior to that. I was appointed to a very elite group in 1980 called the International Theological Commission, which was a group appointed to advise the Pope. And in that role, I had all of the fabled theologians of my student days. They were on that commission with me, the great men we looked up to, whose books we read and studied and analyzed. All the libraries, the Vatican Library included. And I still couldn't find answers to those great questions. 
Well, the first glimmer I began to get was when I found Ramtha's teachings. I'm a member of Ramtha School of Enlightenment for many years. And that gave an entire new dimension to everything I had studied before and what I focused on studying from then on. So that is something that I treasure greatly. I'm not here to recruit for Ramtha School. Well, we do need teachers in this regard. The, the second event I went to was a one-on-one -on -one with just about 20, 25 people there, very small group. And we all got to ask uh, personal questions. And uh, he turned around and just nailed me, pointed at me and said, Master, he said, what say you? And, and uh, I wasn't ready for it. And he says, what do you see? And uh, I said, I see a very wise and powerful, loving being, you know, a master teacher. And he said, Master, he said, what you see is you. He said, because if it wasn't within self, you couldn't recognize it. And he said, it's time you get on with it and own it and get on with your work. And, and uh, he said, so be it. And that was it. And that's how all this came about. <laughs> After that, I got on with my work. There's a lot of God salesmen out there. There's a lot of people that need the fame and the, and the uh, notoriety. Um, I'm not one of those people. I, I love my hermit life. I love my time with nature. I love to spend time with other people that are on this path and, and that are spiritually motivated. Um, as far as becoming a guru or being worshipped by the masses, uh, that is furthest out of my consciousness and, and there's no way I want to have anything to do, do with that role whatsoever. Those who have put out the thought of conscious contact and then seen a UFO do a power-up know for certain that they have contacted and been contacted by something out of this world. And then those who are becoming enlightened also know there's another type of UFO, much closer to home, waiting to power up, waiting to be discovered. The greatest UFO we're ever going to experience on the planet is our own physical bodies. and. When we can increase our frequencies, we can actually move out of these bodies and experience all of these other planes and dimensions. We have that capability within us, and we also have the capability to actually take the body with us as well in what they call the ascension process. So we have the ability to jump to other planes, other dimensions, biolocate, other timelines. So those are Tarsian vortexes, and if you ever see one of those and you walk into it, be sure to walk out exactly on the same place you went in, because there are time shifts as well as place shifts. It's, it's totally unlimited, the potential we have within ourselves. I realize that each individual has that spark, and some have ignited it to some level, um, more so than others. And it just depends on how much we've expanded in consciousness and awareness as to how much we're aware of that divine potential within us, and that is what I was teaching, focusing on a very high spiritual path and assisting others to attain uh, their own God consciousness, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I had no idea that the ETs would enter into this until later. The ET connection would come to James at Mount Adams, revered for centuries by Native Americans. The Yakima tribe has many stories of unusual craft and lights in its vicinity, and for James, himself part Cherokee, it was as if the mountain was calling, at least in visions, which were now a regular feature of his life. I was receiving visions over and over again, and the visions showed me this beautiful mountain, a river on the eastern border, and then a little mountain behind me. And I actually saw the letters Little Mountain, and I, and I didn't know what that, I said, why are they focusing on the Little Mountain? It makes no sense whatsoever when you have this massive Mount Adams in front of you, which is just beautiful. And I kept seeing this vision over and over again, and so I grabbed a map of the United States, and I got a pendulum, and I was going over the map to find it. My hand got real hot over Trout Lake, and it just started spinning radically, the pendulum. And I marked it. Uh, on the map and my whole focus was to create a template of heaven on earth how we can live a wholesome spiritual life in harmony with nature and each other and also uh, grow our own foods and grow very high vibrational uh, 
energetic foods and things of that nature as well, but to cover the whole gamut, not just one aspect of it. So something triggered you at some point to make the move. Yeah, the, the, it was a combination of, of seeing the vision and my purpose, knowing that I was supposed to build this template of much bigger center and to do a lot of the things that I was teaching there. And at the same time, I also had the visions of the earth changes coming to that area. James has photographic evidence of the higher frequencies and realms that he's experienced. While the human brain filters certain frequencies, digital cameras record energy fields and entities that are unseen by the average human mind. Detractors may attempt to explain these anomalies away as lens aberrations, but the evidence persists. Orbs, for example, which are conscious but disembodied beings, and plasma entities as well, are frequently photographed at James Ranch. Don't jump off in 10 minutes during the soap opera while the ads are on and go out and snap three or four miserable pictures and hope to get dramatic orb manifestations because they will treat you with the disdain with which you are treating them. Some are like this, some are bitter. Some of them are golden, the others are infrared. This is straight up into a black night sky. And this is a black night sky where visitors are engaged in what's termed a sky watch. They're scanning the skies above Mount Adams in the hope of seeing UFOs for themselves. And many do have that experience. There it goes. Here it goes. It's going. <laughs> Check it out. Look at that. Thank you. Critics, of course, continue to deny that any of this is real. But many more have a genuine desire to actually experience visual and conscious contact. Some of these ships that, were, that are coming over here right now, some look like satellites, and some are satellites, and some are not. And the only way you can tell really is through being able to connect with them consciously. But they'll fly high first, and they scan the group and see where you're at in consciousness. And if there's a lot of skepticism and negativity or whatever, they'll stay higher. If we really focus love and joy and bliss out to them and say, hey, we want to see you, we want you to come down, They'll come down as low as the consciousness can rise to the occasion. In the very beginning, some of the ETs that came here, which are what I call low-level contacts, uh, had an agenda, and it wasn't in our highest and best good. And they aligned with people who also had the same consciousness, because the mind in which you seek is the mind which you connect. So we have people that were more focused on technology and war and uh, that was their whole drive is to have the best technology to win the wars and and so they connected with some low-level contacts at the same time there's another group that came in that said look we are not we're not going to give you the technology until you choose peace and that is the group that we should have aligned ourselves with but instead they aligned with the lower evolved ETs, you might say, for technology. And there was a trade involved where they were actually abducting people and using genetics, uh, our genetics to with add to With approval? They, the abduction scenario was with approval with, with our own government at the time. And it got a little out of hand. It went far beyond what they expected. And the trade was technology for genetics because this group is a dying race and they evolved into pure knowledge. They have very large heads. They're very brilliant in their minds, but they bred emotions out of their race. They came back to and started abducting people to uh, create hybrids. The great questions are, where did we come from? Why are we here? Well... What if space was, in fact, the birthplace of DNA as we know it? DNA shared throughout the galaxies by evolving civilizations. And what if our grossly misnamed junk DNA is actually the DNA of the gods, waiting to be activated and holding within it the keys to our future as genuinely enlightened members of the intergalactic family? We have extremely incredible genetics on this planet. We have the genetics from 
the star nations, you might say. In here we see the original stone carving in Samaria of a giant instructing people. Their giants were half-human offspring of the Nephilim. They could run 40 miles an hour. They could run a horse down on foot and knock it to the ground with their bare hands. It's a big smorgasbord or zoo of genetics, you might say. Not just human genetics, but animal and plant genetics as well. So this is such an amazing place because of the diversity of life here and the diversity of genetics is nowhere else in the universe. And it, it needs to be preserved because of that. DNA from Earth might save a dying space race, but the human race, though it has reached for the moon, seems almost oblivious to what's really happening at home. Preoccupied with endless wars, we ignore global warming, hurricanes, widespread destruction, pollution on a global scale, from the melting Antarctic and ozone depletion to the melting Arctic, where wildlife is increasingly endangered. What was once a mother planet that nurtured all its species is now a mother in danger of dying. The uh, greater family of man, or, or the op-worlders, you might call them, are deeply concerned with where we're going, concerning the environment. You know, we've had the, the earthquakes and volcanic activities has increased 400%. Uh, we've got over 50 plus active volcanoes right now and counting. How many volcanoes could erupt if prompted by a large gravitational field? This is the location of all the volcanoes on the Earth. That's a lot. There's undersea volcanoes going off. That's also heating up the ocean. Look at the yellow now, would it? Oh. Going on right now. There's over 50 dead zones in the ocean right now. One of them is over 700 miles wide. There's another bigger one that's opening up right now. There's no plankton there. So there, again, there's no oxygen. Dr. Robert Diaz of the Virginia Institute of Marine Science notes that dead zones are most often associated with population areas and nutrient runoff, which can cause complete oxygen depletion and total mortality of marine life. Oregon State University is researching an unusual dead zone related series of events off the Pacific Northwest. They're finding huge numbers of dead crabs and dead and dying seals suffering from leptospirosis. While the majority of dead zones are less than a thousand square kilometers, the largest is over 70,000 square kilometers in size. We're taking out the rainforest and our forests here, we're, we're raping the forest right now, it's the same thing. When you aggravate that with the pollution and with the you know, increase in CO2 and other emissions, we're actually on a fast track to extinction. Scientists may not use the words fast track to extinction, but pollution has been building and accelerating around the world for centuries. Unburned aviation gas is added to the problem with the potential to catch fire. Other scientists have been monitoring global warming and melting ice caps for decades. Satellite tracking over Antarctica is helping supply information on how rapidly that continent is seeing its ice sheets and glaciers crumble and melt. Since the recent breakup of the Larsen B ice shelf, glaciers in Antarctica have been moving toward the ocean up to eight times faster than previously. But at the other end of the world, decades of strange behavior. Once, the ice reflected sunlight back into space. But as the ice melts, more sunlight hits the water, heating the ocean, and that accelerates next season's ice melt. And this is what's happened in just the past 25 years. The serious consequence of all that fresh water flowing into the ocean is that the Atlantic conveyor belt, the current that regulates climate around the world, will eventually stall.
A report commissioned for the U.S. Department of Defense says that could happen abruptly, perhaps as soon as 2010, and Europe will have a Siberian climate. The sun is building to a period of solar maximum storms in 2010 or 2011. Nothing like it has been seen since the world became dependent on microchips. Huge coronal mass ejections are expected. One of these could knock out everything on Earth that generates or uses electricity. A small flare in December 2006 disrupted airplane GPS landing systems for 15 minutes. Fortunately, none of the thousands of planes that were in the air actually crashed that time. Although few dare mention it, James says a dire scenario is unfolding. To quote a report prepared for the U.S. Department of Defense in 2003, the gradual climate change scenario may be a dangerous act of self-deception. The plausibility of abrupt climate change is higher than most of the scientific community and perhaps all of the political community is prepared for. Evidence suggests that such an abrupt climate change could occur in the near future. This same scenario has been gone over again and again and again, ending up in major cataclysms on the planet, both brought about naturally and also through technology. The Earth nearly died during another cataclysm much earlier than the flood of Noah, destroying the great civilizations of Atlantis and Mu. This is a very ancient map, by the way, called the Nuzi map. And it shows Mu on the left-hand side of your screen and Atlantis on the right-hand side of your screen. If you ever get the two confused in your mind, now you know where they are. Of course, they're sunk beneath the sea for now. We're moving into the same uh, epic, you might say, journey where we're right at the apex of it again, where we're going to choose, are we going to destroy ourselves and allow technology to supersede spirituality? Or are we going to go through a major spiritual awakening and realize that we live in this incredible sea of consciousness like quantum physics tells us that everything is connected? Just how connected is the Earth? That is graphically illustrated in this U.S. Geological Survey website animation that shows just one week of earthquake activity. The bigger the square, the bigger the quake, and they're happening all the time. Note how the Kuril Islands, between Russia and Japan, which has experienced regular five-plus quakes for months, has an 8.5 and then a 6.1 quake on the same day. Tsunami warnings were issued, but fortunately, nothing like the devastating 2004 Banda Aceh tsunami occurred this time. That one took almost a quarter million lives. James' visions of tsunamis hitting the west coast of the United States have also yet to be realized. But he believes that nature, Mother Earth, is rebelling against decades of exploitation. You know, we need to get our act together and realize that what's more important, you know, making that almighty dollar or taking a breath. Trout Lake has short, hot, dry summers. It's home to organic farmers and good people, and a fine place to camp if you're attending a conference at the sanctuary. But then winter arrives, making for difficult access through snow that can easily bury a car overnight. James has his detractors, critics he says who suffer from cognitive dissonance, which raises an interesting question. There's a question I've always wanted to ask a tractor driver, and that is, what is cognitive dissonance? Oh, cognitive dissonance is the total inability to accept any belief outside of your own. 
Does that uh, translate perhaps another definition as a closed mind? Yes, no matter how much evidence or how much proof you give somebody, they'll automatically just refuse to accept any reality outside their own box, you might say. Is this a uh, widespread disorder? <laughs> I'd say both of the Earth is uh, suffering to one degree or another with it. And there's a cure? I believe the cure is to just, again, you know, face life with an open mind, a loving heart, and pure intent, and allow the universe to teach you things. But are we willing to learn that UFOs can look like clouds? They could be actually sitting within a cloud and watching us at any time. But I'm not saying all clouds are UFOs. There are natural formations of clouds that are lenticular and others of that nature. But uh, it is highly possible that the uh, fields around the UFOs generate uh, kind of a cloud formation around the ship. They're talking a lot about the future and uh, how we have to prepare and there's going to be a lot of cleanup on every level of consciousness, the environment, everything, and nature is going to be very active in this process. As far as nature is concerned, uh, our whole heliosphere, our solar system is moving to a new place in the universe where there's the leading edge of it as we're moving is a thousand times brighter and all the planets are heating up, they're putting out four times more light, they're going through atmospheric changes, the sun is reacting to this, throwing off massive coronal mass ejections and solar flares and that's affecting our weather, it's affecting our communication, it's affecting our consciousness as well. We've just seen the beginning of the earth changes, they're going to escalate, uh, it's going to be very intense in the next couple of years. Jane says that just as there are four seasons in a year, which means everything from ants to humans must prepare for winter, there are much longer planetary cycles or seasons, spanning thousands of years, and we are in a season of planetary changes, which have always involved global earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanic activity that creates magma vents like Mount Adams. Uh, Mount Adams has a very, very long history of UFO activity. It has at least a hundred year history of, of people seeing the ships. They've got forest rangers and fire tower operators and uh, a lot of the police, the tribal police, everybody. It just has a real long history of, of UFO activity. The, in the ancient times, they said that when they're wounded or people got wounded or were sick or ill, they used to take them to a certain place and they would come from the interior of the mountain and pick their sick or their wounded up and take them into the mountain and then, and then the shaman or the chief would get a, a message, like a telepathic message this time and they would go back up and pick their people up and they'd be completely well. So there's a lot of history about uh, interaction with those on the interior which is where the UFOs are coming in and out of this mountain. Yeah, okay, I can see the mountain now. Well, yeah, it's just there it is. I got it. See how bright they are? Yeah, okay, I've got the mountain. Come on, my Whoa, wow. I've got those two guys. Awesome. And I've got the mountain. Boys on the mountain. There they are. Wow. Watching ships power up and come out of the mountain and, and actually go into the mountain, they seem to dematerialize and, and go straight through the mountain and then rematerialize on the inside. So it's my understanding, according to the legends, that there's a base there, there's a complete underground city there. Um, I've heard legends of it as a crystal city, very beautiful place. Uh, all I can go by is the legends having not gone there myself. Oh, there he goes. There he goes. Look at him. Look at him power up. Did you see that? I got that whole thing on film. For years, James and others have filmed UFOs with basic consumer camcorders. In other words, as James says, well, anybody can shoot UFOs. All it takes is an open mind, loving heart, and pure intent, and put the thought out there, and, and they'll find you eventually. So it's, it's nothing special about photographing UFOs. Before the flood, they were here. There were giants in the earth in those days. But in Numbers, chapter 13, verse 33, it says again, and they, there we saw giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were as grasshoppers. 
Now, giants. I discovered, of course, that the word in the Hebrew text was not giants. It was Nephilim. And that means the ones that come down from above. So the proper translation is there at the bottom. It's not when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and got involved in all this hanky-panky. Instead, it's the bottom line. When the sons of the gods came into the daughters of men is the proper translation. All of those ancient texts talk about the different ships. Uh, they, they say they are ships that are, are physical. There are ships that are pure energy. There are ships that are magnetized light ships. There are ships that are pure consciousness. The Nephilim were only about 200 strong. That's not enough to conquer a planet. So they worked to the kings. The giants were their offspring, including a tribe known as the Nephilim. The kings are actually ruling the earth, but the Nephilim are behind them, advising them, giving them technology, giving them social structure and social order. There are also frescoes all around Europe in the churches on the walls which show depictions of very holy scenes. Uh, one I love is where uh, Jesus is being baptized and, uh, and there's this beautiful gold disc above him sending all these rays down on top of them. So there's a very, very long history of uh, advanced civilizations interacting with the earth. And this is the first sentence of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, many years ago when I was studying Hebrew, I had some difficulty. The first was this one. The word Elohim. I am in Hebrew is a plural. And yet Elohim is supposed to be the name for God. One God. It's well known that in ancient Hebrew writing, if you're dealing with fundamental issues, say like the creation of the world, you always began with the first letter of the alphabet because they were big on symbolism. Yet here we have the quintessentially important account of beginnings, and it doesn't begin with the first letter, Alif, A. What does it begin with? B, P. So where did the A go? And if we put it back, what do we get? Abakrashi, Bara Elohim, the father of the beginnings, or the father at first, created the Elohim, the heavens and the earth. Or he created the gods, the heaven and the earth. The establishment of the center here there was many levels to it. Uh, one of the levels, the original name for it was Sapa Sanctuary, which means to aspire to the highest levels of wisdom and beauty and art and, and you know, basically uh, reach the highest levels of creativity we can. And then it involved into E-Study, which stands for Enlightened Contact with Extraterrestrial Intelligence. You know, they've transcended war, disease, poverty, They've uh, transcended all religious boundaries and cultural boundaries. And they have that wisdom and that technology to share with humanity, which is in direct conflict with those who are capitalizing at the expense of humanity Earth. The, the main problem is on this planet is the leadership. And the leadership does not reflect the desires and wishes of the masses. And there's another element involved, which is Hollywood, which gets a lot of funding to keep this negative agenda going, which is which is very sad because if you talk to most of the kids now about ETs, the first image they give you is either a gray, which is abducting people or experimenting, experimenting a lot of fear around it, or they're here to conquer us, you know, slice and dice us and turn us into fertilizer and or eat us or, or whatever, or they're bugs that are coming here to destroy the universe. Hollywood has certainly had an impact. Meanwhile, lovers of the Armageddon scenario, and even some of today's feet-on-the-ground scientists, envisage civilization as we know it disappearing from this planet, perhaps much sooner than later. Some worry that Earth will eventually destroy itself with our help. That's the unspoken end result 
of global warming and increasing natural disasters. But those who love terror, including masters of the past and present, and off-worlders as James Gillilander calls them, have all had a common message of hope about humanity's true potential, which is why they've set the example of spiritual awakening. I think the common thread between all of the Masters and the ETs as well, because they're giving the same messages that all of the Masters have been giving for thousands of years. And, you know, it follows under the, the understandings that, uh, you know, that there is no separation in omnipresence, that we're all connected, we all came from the same source, we all go back to the same source. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, what your culture is, what your religion is, what your uh, beliefs are. And they teach the basic universal principles such as universal peace and brother sister love and, and living in harmony with each other and the planet. And all of the masters have given us this message and a lot of these messages, messages were inspired by the ETs over the past and then got twisted and warped by kings and institutions. But the main message right now that they're giving us is they are very concerned with our consciousness on the earth and our primitive, aggressive, warlike nature. They want us to let that go. They want us to release the past because these old grudges and old belief systems are what is creating our tomorrow and what is creating the wars and all the other problems that we're having. Uh, they want us to stop with the greed and the competition and start cooperating and working together. Is it so hard to imagine that among the billions of stars and quadrillions of planets out there, there are indeed greater civilizations? How hard would it be to be a greater civilization than the one that currently inhabits Earth? Instead of reaching for the stars to meet those greater beings, we have reached for our guns, and we've become one of the most warlike species in the universe. We use, or threaten to use, atomic weapons to ensure peace. We talk of peace. We fight for peace. We kill for peace. We embrace war. First of all, there, there's no such thing as a holy war. Um, every war is because one king or leader wanted what another king or leader had. And that is the main drive, or motivation behind these wars. Uh, when both sides are praying to God for victory, what does God do? The first greeting we give these off-world visitors is aggression, and we send up our, our best technologies in the area to greet them and attempt to shoot them down, steal their technology, and use it in the war industry. And that's the program right now. That's changing right now because we realize that 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 option is not really working very well because these, these beings coming here now are so far beyond anything that we have. There's really nothing we can do about them. We have a golden opportunity right now to join the rest of the universe in peace and to unite with these beings that are extremely spiritually and technologically advanced, uh, far beyond anything we can imagine and they can assist us to transcend war and disease and clean up our environment. And to me, that's the, that's the ultimate goal. That's our goal here at Steady to bridge the gap and to rise to the occasion so we can have these contacts and can share in this information. And, and that is our whole goal, and take this information and disseminate it out to humanity Earth, Earth to help us in our own quantum leap and in consciousness and evolution.